All right, here we are. It says live. You got anybody waiting? Um, not on my screen here yet. Okay. So. Not on mine either. <laughs> you only have Bryce waiting. Okay. Well, we can just go. Okay. All right. Yep. All right. Yep. We are live. Okay, this is Mark coming to you from Baker's Green Acres, and tonight's our Tuesday night uh, showcase of somebody could be anybody but tonight it's Bryce Mosier he's a local farmer local to me he lives over in Falmouth and Bryce's specialty is a vegetable CSA is that about right yeah yep that's what we uh mainly focus on okay so I know last year when we talked um you were pretty well sold out all your CSA shares were sold out so um, first of all um, could we get a little bit of background on you um, you know because people are interested like where you got your start you know is it a hobby is this a full-time thing for you and and what your life kind of looks like well you know the way we got into this was kind of by chance and almost being forced into it in a sense. Back in 2015, I got very ill. Um, I was down for about five months with what they considered to be uh, migraines. We've since found out that it's not, it's you know a different condition. But um, after that point, I, I decided, I didn't know if I'd be able to work in the traditional workforce anymore. Um, we'd always gardened um, and we'd had a larger garden the season before and after sitting down and thinking about it I needed to find a way that I could actually work from home still put food on the table in more than one way and uh, you know the following year we made plans um, we got into it started a CSA it was very small that first year I think we had four or five people um, and then we did some farm markets we sold some stuff to some stores um, and then it snowballed from there. The following year, we were at like 30 people so quickly that we had to shut off, you know, our uh, signups for CSA. And last year, I think we were at uh, 38 people. And this year, we drew the line at 40 because we're also supplying another farm with the vegetables for their CSA this year. So, wow. in sense, we're, uh, we're we're doing 50 shares. We still got a contract for some vegetables, you know, wholesale, and then. Uh, one of the things we're going to focus on this season too is uh, canning. Um, we had 25 people on our list of tomatoes last year when we finished, so we could have sold 25 more people bushels. Um, beans were the same way. We had, I don't know, 15, 17 people that were still left over after we were done with the beans last year. So we're going to focus a little bit more on that, make sure that the people that want to do some canning will we'll have their stuff for them this year. Okay. So that's that's really fortunate that it took off like that. Do you have uh, any idea what made that happen? You know, there's a lot of people in the area, I think, that are getting at that age where they don't want to be bent over in the garden all day. Yeah. Um, our, our price point's quite low considering what we get, you know, our customers get out of it. Um, reason for that is, is it, you know, what they're paying me covers all my, you know, expenses. Plus, I put a little bit of money in our pocket. But the, the big thing was, is the CSA is supposed to support our endeavor in farming every year. Um, by having 30 signups, you know, we charge $150 for a uh, half share. And that's what most of our people get is a half share. And that gets them 12 weeks of uh, basically your grocery, your paper grocery bag full every week. Um, we do have quite a few of the full shares again this year, but most of them are doing the half share. You know, it, it seems to work out to where a lot of these people are, you know, seeing their aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters getting shares from us. And the next thing you know, they're they're calling us. Um, we've had to okay. turn people away this year um, because we, we had too many people wanting to sign up. Okay. So there is a market for it. If, if somebody in the area were do both the same thing, I'm sure they'd have pretty good success with it. Okay. So you you do more than just uh, row crop, and you have greenhouses now too, as well, right? Yep, we have uh, two thirty by seventy twos. 
Um, one is brand new. We just finished it this year. The other one, yep. I think we put up in 2018. And then we've also got our small seedling house. Um, and that's all that thing's used for. It's a 14 by 20, strictly for our transplants. Um, everything I grow, I grow from seed myself. And you know, we don't okay. buy any plants outside other than our onions. You know, I got to plug Dixondale for that. You, you can't get better transplants than what Dixondale can get you. I can't grow them as cheap as they can get them to me for it. So. Okay. <laughs> but other than that, yeah, I, I grow everything here from, from seed. Um, our outdoor production area is only about maybe maybe an acre. And we pulled 6,500 you know, pounds of produce off it last year. Wow. Wow. So yep. what's your background? I mean, where did you learn how to do all this? Um, well, being stuck in a recliner with ice bags on your head for about six months, you do a lot of reading. Um, Is that what it was? Yeah, that was most of it. I've got family, you know, when we were kids, my grandpa had a huge potato garden. Uh, he had yeah. a root cellar every year, all the older grandkids, which I was the leader of, um, we would go over there and pick potato bugs, um, you know, hold the weeds, you know, so we had a little bit of gardening background but most of it was you know through books um there were some youtube channels uh curtis stone um jm fortier you know some of those guys that elliot coleman's another one um yeah and, and all the books um good stuff i don't do everything the way they do it um i tried to do the old uh you know compact high density stuff my ground won't support it you know i our, no. our stuff would be pine trees just a few years ago so we had to clear tree pull stumps and we're building soil but it's it's been a process yeah everything really gets better yeah well i've been to bryce's house so we're pretty well neighbors we're in the next town from where bryce is and uh for the listening audience if you'd like to see some more of what we're talking about here in pictures, you can go back through on the tribe because Bryce has posted quite a few pictures on the tribe and it's been really helpful to, you know, actually see it in pictures, what's going on. I know it's helpful to me because I, I get a picture in my mind, but when I can see it, it, it does help me out a little bit. Um, so what, um, I think people are probably wondering, uh, we're, we are going to take questions, by the way, for the listening audience. If you have questions about, I guess this would fall in the in the category of row cropping. Is that accurate? Yeah. Or I truck mean, gardening, something like that? Yeah. I mean, we, we do, everything we do is on 100-foot rows, except for what's in the tunnel. Um, okay. Those are only 72-foot rows. But everything else is, like, when I plant Swiss chard, I'm planting 100 foot of it. Um, I found that knowing those numbers, knowing how many sets I need, I can make my plan a lot easier that way. So I, I would consider it row cropping. Um, it is fairly high density, but at the same time, I do all my own, you know, mechanical cultivation by hand with the tractor. So I've got to leave a little space for that kind of stuff. Okay. It wouldn't be near as dense as what your home garden would be in the background, you know. I think uh, row cropping is a lot of times associated with uh, contract farming where you grow and then you sell to like Del Monte or some of yep. the, the really big canners, but you are selling retail. So you're selling it directly to the end user. Can you yep. kind of tell us what that model looks like? You know, how you well, get customers and. Yeah. I mean, for, for most part, like our, Probably, I would say probably two thirds of our sales come from the CSA. Um, and that's not in dollars, that's in like what produce goes out because our, our CSA customers probably get about a 40%, 50% discount buying it like that. Um, okay. They're helping us out. I don't have to pay out the initial investment every season for seeds and compost. All that's covered by our CSA money. Um, okay. Usually we start in like December. Um, we'll start planning for the next year, how many shares we want to do. Um, you know, we've got like uh, a couple different grocery stores in the area that we'll supply cherry tomatoes to, cucumbers. Um, so we, we make a plan of what we're going to grow that year. And then we start our sign up and we 
hit our number. Usually this year it was right around end of February we hit our, our mark um, where we, okay. we had full, full capacity. Um, not to say we couldn't do more, but I don't like stretching it quite that thin. Um, I want to make sure I've got all my you know bases covered there. But as far as like as advertising and whatnot, it's mostly been word of mouth, Facebook, um, marketplace has probably drummed up, you know, maybe five customers is all, six customers. But as far as like word of mouth, um, people seeing us at markets, you know, that that's been kind of our top, you know, advertisement right there. Yeah. Hey, before we go any further, could you explain to the viewing audience what a CSA, you've used that acronym a couple of times, but what does that mean? Well, CSA is basically a model of getting paid either a portion of or the entire payment for their produce. Um, I mean, it stands for community supported agriculture, but for us, what we do is, you know, we, we're going to give them 12 weeks of vegetables every week. They pick something up. Um, it's usually one paper bag full, you know, like a grocery bag full of whatever's in harvest that week. Um, and in turn, what they do is they get a discount for doing it, you know, pay, prepaying for it for the season. Okay. And by supporting us that way, they're sharing some of the risk. You know, if, if you bought a sure. share from me and my corn fails, you know, luckily I haven't had that problem, but um, <coughs> they do share some of that risk with us. Whereas if I'm, you know, out here growing deer corn and it fails, nobody else is going to help me with that. Right. Right. So yeah, it, we, it does take a little bit of the burden off as far as like upfront costs every season. That's the big thing, you know, because you know, every year we're spending five, six hundred dollars on seeds, compost. Um, you know, we put up a couple greenhouses. There's a lot of different things that we're paying for before the season, before we even start harvesting anything. Um, and by doing it with the CSA model where they pay prepay for everything, you know, it, that helps to where I can kind of dig in my own pocket you know, cover it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We kind of do that with chickens too. Like if people want 50 chickens, we, we have them pay for half, you know, half of the estimated costs up front. And that way it eliminates the, when, when the chickens are here and they're processed, we call them and say, Hey, your chickens are ready. Oh, I, I don't, I don't really want them now. It eliminates that. So um, I, you probably have the same thing going for you people have already paid for it or paid a partial payment on it. So exactly. it makes them serious about it. Yeah, and I think you're gonna find that the ones that are searching for people like you and I and other farms like us, Yeah. Um, most of them, I mean, you're gonna have a couple bad apples in the bunch, but most of them are, they're looking for you for a reason. They're not looking for, you know, cheap carrots. They're looking for someone that grows good carrots without, you know, pesticides and all the other things that, you know, kind of make you want to you know shy away from the stores um yeah so and like i said most of our customers they return every year um we've lost a few because you know they thought they were getting too much produce that they were wasting um huh. now, now they just show up every so often at our doorstep and hey what do you got i can buy this week and they'll pick up a couple of heads of lettuce and you know some tomatoes or whatever but they don't they just didn't use as much as what we were giving them in our shares okay have you ever thought about having a uh, like a store there where people, you know, like a self-serve type store, kind of like Hidden Creek does? Yeah, you know, it's crossed my mind. Um, one of the, the problems with that for us is when, we, like, let's say our radishes are ready to be harvested. We harvest all of them, wash them all, bunch them all, and they go into our walk-in cooler. And then we've got to, you know, pick up the next thing that's got to go in. For us to keep stocking like a store shelf would be one extra task yeah. um, because the way we got our CSA working, about 50% pick up here at the house. The other 50% on Monday nights, we deliver to Cadillac and people just meet us in the parking lot at Farm and Home um, and okay. pick up the produce then. So it'd be more of a, a an extra task for us to stock a store. Um, but I mean, it is something we've considered. Yeah. But I've seen it work. Here. I know. 
I know a couple families that do it, plus Hidden Creek does it. And um, they wind up, uh, let's say, I'm not sure if they do bees or not right off the top of my head, but there's somebody around there that does bees. And then they'll just put their, their stuff in their shop to sell. So nice. a lot of things that are being sold out of their, their uh, store might not be theirs. And I've seen where that works well. Um, anybody that's coming to your property is a member. So it's not like it's open to the public. So you can, gotcha. you can sell whatever you want. Yeah. So you know, every week we do have, you know, if tomatoes are in season, there's always the customer that picks up their bag and says, Hey, can I get an extra half a dozen tomatoes from you? And we do that, but it's usually just a individual sale every time. It's not like we have them, you know, on a shelf or something for them to pick up. Okay. Um, we, we interact with the customers every week. Okay. So that's, that's a lot of produce. Um, how many people are doing this? In our area? There's no, I mean, what kind of staff? Of, no, what kind of staff do you have? Oh, it's it's basically just, you know, we've lost some of our workforce. You know, the kids have all moved out of the house, except yeah. for Sophie. Um, that was a, a lot of my, you know, grunt work right there. Um, yeah. But we've got, you know, my wife and I, and then Sophie, she's eight. Um, and then we've got four ladies that work for their shares. Um, okay. Every week they put in two to four hours harvesting for us. Um, I know between the months of June and July, they get really sick of picking beans because that's what <laughs> we have most of. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it works out well. Like I said, I've tried to work it to where I've got a lot more tools that work for the way I grow or I'm changing the way I grow to work for the tools I've got. Okay. So that it, yeah. it's a lot, le you know, a lot less labor intensive. Um, weeding, I don't pull any weeds by hand. If I'm pull pulling weeds by hand, I've already lost. Um, it's all got to be mechanical cultivation, either with a two-wheel hoe, stirrup hoe, or the tractor. Okay. You know, I don't. Yeah, we don't weed by hand. Okay. Well, now, uh, you're not a certified organic farm, are you? No, no, we've looked into that and it's ridiculous what they charge for that. Um, and what we would gain out of it would be absolutely nothing. I mean, it'd be a complete loss for us. Okay, um, could you now explain we that? Explain that to people, because well, I think people it. think, okay. Yeah, you know, the biggest thing is the paperwork. I would almost have to have mm -hmm. a full-time employee just to do the paperwork from the research I've done and the people I've talked to. Um, really? And then you've got the, you know, associated costs which are our programs to cost share that, but uh, why am I paying for certification that I really don't need to do if I show you what I'm growing? You know, if you want to know how I grow it, stop by and look, I'll show you. Um, yeah. I don't need a, a USDA certification to, to show you how I grow it. Um, and I'm not marketing this stuff to like other wholesalers. It's like when I go to the grocery store, they really don't care how I grow it. It's a pretty red grape tomato um and it's grown locally that's that's how they sell it they're not selling yeah. it as an organic you know as a organic product they're just selling it as a locally grown grape tomato um but we don't use you know the only thing we use for uh, pesticides around here would be like uh the beetle beater for the potato bugs which is an organic okay. you know listed product um Last year, I used zero. I mean, I didn't use any pesticides at all. Um, year before, we used some beetle beater. And then I think I treated the uh, tomatoes once for hornworm with BT, which is also, you know, a, an organic product. Um, and I, I would never reach for anything that I, I wouldn't feel comfortable feeding to my kids and my wife and myself. So, and everybody else, I'm, you know, I'm open, transparent. If you want to know how I'm growing it, come look. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have to get with you on the, the potato bug thing because we have really bad potato bugs here. You know, I tried the whole frost blanket on them to try and keep them things out of there, but they come out of the dirt. Yeah. If they're on there, you either got to wash them off every day with, you know, good neem oil and soap, or you've got to, you know, just treat them with beetle beater. Um, beetle beater. What is that? Yeah. It's uh, I get it from Bonite. It's, 
you can pick it up at co-op and it's organic listed you know it's omr or ormi listed product um i believe it's spinosad is what the the you know actual chemical in it is yeah um, and I, I usually one spraying two sprayings at the most huh. in the course of a season and it, you don't even got to worry about them huh I'm going to keep that in mind because that's the one thing that and, uh, squash bugs we have a hard time with. Squash bugs, I usually just try and plant more squash than what I need, and now yeah. donate what you know what they need to them. <laughs> um, what what's the we, story with that product seven? Do you know about that stuff? Yeah, I mean, I, I stay away from it. Um, you would. Yeah, there's. It, it, most of it is organic pesticide, um, but problem is it can, you know, it lingers on the plant a lot longer. Um, honeybees, we raise honeybees, so I've never okay. used it around here. Um, and it is damaging to the bees um, and pretty much any other insect life. And, you know, there are beneficial insects in the garden just because see something flying sure. doesn't mean it's bad. Um, right. Yeah, so we stay away from the dusty type stuff. If I if I do any spraying at all, um, it would be like first thing in the morning. So that goes on there when everything else is already wet or late at night when it's already starting to, you know, when the bugs aren't out and just okay. take care of the pests that are on the plants. But for the most part, most of our stuff like our lettuce, cabbage, that kind of thing, we try and use a physical barrier, you know, a physical barrier with a frost blanket or a remay or something like that where they just can't okay. get to the plant so the, the business that you're in you're trying to get stuff early and go late yep so can you talk to the audience about that you know well i mean there's different ways to extend the season we didn't have greenhouses when we started this at all mm -hmm. um you know we were doing the take them out during the day and set them on the picnic table and then bring them back in the house at night for all of our transplants um and then we did make some low tunnel hoops out of some like uh, half inch conduit. I yeah. still have got a pile of them out there. I use them all the time. Stick them in the ground, throw some remay over it, and you got yourself about six degrees of uh, frost protection. So you know you can drop to like 25, 26, and those plants will still be okay. Um, okay. Now what we're basically doing is, and this year I'm doing more of it, intercropping. Where the last two years in our first tunnel. I would basically just grow peppers, um, tomatoes, and cucumbers in there. Well, this year I'm going to be planting radishes, beets, some carrots, and especially early on some lettuce that will actually be in there and established before I plant tomatoes or peppers or whatever in there. So I'm sharing that space and, and kind of condensing what I'm putting in there. Yeah. Um, and, it's not really a necessity, you know, necessity for what we're doing because our shares don't start going out until mid June, and I really don't need a tunnel in order to fill a bag in June. Um, you know, cabbage and broccoli, cauliflower, all that'll grow right through the frost. Um, okay. So yeah, there's there's different ways of doing it for the home gardener. You know, a small frost blanket and a couple of wires, and you got yourself all the frost protection you need for most things. Um, you know, just your warm loving crops like your tomatoes and peppers and stuff. You just wait until you're frost free and put those out. Yep. Yep. All right. So you're primarily uh, plants. You're primarily vegetables. You do some livestock. Yeah, we've got a few American guinea hog pigs. Um, they're just for us, you know, we have sold a half a pig here or there, but um, they're more for us than anything else. Um, Nikki's got a couple dairy goats, a couple Nubians. Um, okay. We took the year off of, we didn't, you know, they're both dried up now. We didn't milk them this year at all. Um, no kids, no nothing this year with those. So they're basically just pets for this year. Um, and then we do some chickens. We've got layers. We were doing eggs with our CSA, but there's no money in that and it just didn't fit um we try and pass people in the area we know there's lots of people selling eggs around here most yeah. of them are doing it the right way we just try and tell our customers you know stop at so-and-so's place pick up you know a dozen eggs if you need them 
Um, and we do some chickens and turkeys. We did do those. And, you know, obviously you knew that from all of our customers went to you to get their butchering done. Um, oh, that's right. So yeah. this, year been, this year, I just basically told them, go see Mark and Jill. Um, we're so busy with what we're doing that it just don't fit. We will be raising, yeah. you know, 25 meat birds for ourselves, a couple turkeys. But it's just basically going to be Sophie taking care of those. And those are going to be our, you know, for our table. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's part of what you're doing too, is you're, you're, um, you're creating dollars by doing the CSA, but you're creating all the food that you need for your table. Oh, so yeah. it's, it's, it's a homesteading operation as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and then we, we like I said, we've got the bees, my brother and I, we started taking or keeping uh, bees a couple of years ago. You know, that's hmm. grown quite a bit. Um, I'm hoping this year to spend a little bit more time with the bees. Um, I think we got about 20 hives now. Um, and then we do maple syrup in the spring. And, you know, there's there's a lot of projects that we do around the house. But um, we're trying to basically just turn vegetables for dollars at this point. And the rest okay. of the stuff is basically just for us, friends, family, that kind of thing. Um, because to really do, like bees to make a lot of money on it you've got to be fully committed to making money on bees um yeah you can't you can't do it as a sideline you know the guys that are doing it making money at it they're doing it for a business the same way with you know vegetable gardening yeah you can make a few bucks at a you know farm market with a small table but if you want to really make a living out of it you've got to commit to it you know it's one of those yeah. not really all or nothing but um you got to pick your your direction at that, you know, like if you're going to do livestock, you got to go all in on livestock. I yeah. don't know. I, I can't say that it can't be done, but it would take a lot more labor force and a lot more resources than what we're willing to put into it. Mm-hmm. You know, to do everything. Yeah, I know when I started, I definitely spread myself thin and I wasn't doing anything really good because I was yep. just interested in so much stuff. And I would think, well, once I get this started, I can just let it go for a while and then I get back to it. And then I, I'd go back to it and it would be a, a train wreck, you know? So yeah. we quit with the produce. We only do produce for ourselves. And I, I like it being small so we can really kind of nurture it and, and experience it, you know? We joke about it now. Not, we would love to have a little. 20 by 40 garden again that we had when we first moved here um yeah. because it would be a be- it would be a beautiful 20 by 40 garden <laughs> um yeah so it, it we're finding ways to do what we're doing um we didn't know how to do this from the beginning you know this was not something that neither one of us grew up on a vegetable farm as a matter of fact neither one of us grew up on farms um we never have had any livestock when i was growing up you know we just had the pet dog um, Nikki's family did keep a garden quite a bit more than what, you know, I'd say my family probably did. Um, but she has no green thumb. You can ask her. She, I can't leave her in charge of none of the plants. <laughs> 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 yeah. No golfing for me in the summers. No, no golfing, no golfing. All right. So let's get into, um, if somebody was going to do something like this, I'm, people might be, uh, they might be saying, well, I wonder what I would have to do to do this. I mean, do you have to go and get a permission slip from, you know, I don't know, the sheriff or anything like that to do anything like this? What is the legal things that you need to do? You said you do farmer's markets. So what's yeah, with that? Well, you got to watch some of the farmer's markets nowadays. They're, they're requiring insurance. Um, and there are reasonable, you know, Campbell risk management. I think it's like 250 bucks for the year. And that gives you your policy that would cover you for farm market. It's real reasonable. Um, and you should be able to cover that. If you're going to be serious about doing farm markets, I would probably do the insurance just because um, we know how people can be with lawsuits and, you know, you can speculate all you want on that. Um, but as far as like getting started on it, um, I guess my advice would be open up a piece of ground and start growing. Um, there was no 
you know, permission slips like you were saying. Um, I did contact the uh, FSA, the uh, USDA. I've had nothing but good luck with those guys. Um, you know, basically the, the high tunnels we've gotten have been through the eQuip program. Um, okay. It doesn't cover all the costs, but it sure made it affordable. Um, and you could, you know, use that program, probably just buy one outright without going the route we did with the buildings. Um, but as far as like just getting started, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hesitate a bit to just start expanding your garden. That's all we really did. Started with a small garden, it got bigger. And then we decided, okay, it's time to open up more ground and do this. Um, yeah. Like I said, we're, we're only one acre of outdoor, really. I mean, it, it might be a little bit over that, but um, I think it's 100 by a little over 200 in one area. Yeah, it's probably about an acre altogether. Um, and like I said, we did 6,500 pounds of produce off it last year, and I do not have oh. very good ground. Um, it's, wow. it's baked with below sand. So yeah, if you've got good ground, you're you're light years ahead of me already. Um, like I said, this was a pine forest up yeah. until the year before we decided to do this. Um, yeah. We've been building soil more than anything else. Um, yeah, invest in your in, growing soil is probably your number one thing. Once you've got the dirt right, the rest of it's a lot easier. I mean, okay. It's like your backyard gardens. If you ain't got compost and you know you ain't got the minerals right on it, you're not gonna grow. But it, it's just a larger scale. Do you do uh, soil samples every year? Who, who do you use? Uh, well, originally we were just taking them to like McBain Grain, um, but now we're we're going with Logan's. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're good. Uh, we were gonna go through Morgan, but. And I do use Morgan composting for a lot of my stuff. I swear by their stuff. It's really good stuff. Um, yeah. And they do offer like a, you know, take your soil test in and then they do the recommendations based on that. Um, I guess the reason I don't go with them is I didn't feel like being guilted into not doing one thing or another. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because our, we, we are doing this on a shoestring budget. I mean, we're, we're not pouring our savings into it it's piece by piece little by little okay well that leads right into the next question and then we can take some questions from the viewing audience where do you where do you hope to grow this in five years is there a is there a five-year plan yeah i mean originally when i started this four years ago um we've probably gone about 30% beyond my five-year plan already than what we had, you know, originally estimated for. Um, so once you get into it, it can snowball fast on you. I mean, you almost got to buckle in because it can go fast. Um, yeah. As far as for another five years down the road, we would always like to stay at this like 35, 40 shares a year because that seems okay. to cover a lot of our expenses. Um, but we'd really like to offer... Um, you know, we've got small outlets in mind, you know, restaurants, some other stores in the area, some friends of ours just bought the Willow Market. Um, we'd like to supply them with some more stuff. You know, as far as like expanding the grow area, I will be doubling that and working on that right now. So we will have almost double capacity in, in five years. Um, but that doesn't mean I'm going to grow my csa that much them csa's they're, they're they're fun we like interacting with all them people um but i sure like the wholesale stuff where i can just take a basket in drop it off and send you an invoice it's yeah. so much easier on us save so much time um sitting yeah. in markets i love i love the interaction at market don't get me wrong i can sit and talk gardening all day with anybody but then at the end of the day I'm, i come home and i've got eight hours, 10 hours that I'm behind. Um, yeah. And I, yeah. and I'm one of those that I'll stay up with a flashlight trying to get caught up. So yeah. Um, farm markets really, uh, you know, I don't mind the occasional market and you probably know as much as I do that if you're going to go into farm markets, you've got to be there all the time. 
to really build a, a reputation and get those customers coming back. For us going occasionally, you know, we've got the locals that know us. We do all right, but um, we we don't have the customer base that a lot of these guys have been doing for a lot of years. Yeah, yeah. So do you do the Cadillac market now? Um, we've had, you know, them come out. We've signed up for the last few years, and we just didn't do it. Um, oh. We wanted to. We had, you know, kind of a thought that, I, I shouldn't say we, it was probably more me, but um, I thought, yeah, we can we can fill a table there every year. Um, yeah. But, it, you know, the chairs keep us busy enough, and then, like I said, we can sell 200 pounds of cherry tomatoes a week by just dropping them off and sending an invoice. Yeah. I ain't got to sit there all day. That's money right. in the bank, too. Yeah. Yeah, it was one of the things that we found about farmers markets was it it sort of started the day before so you had to get all your stuff together the day before and then you're up early in the morning going traveling you're setting up your table getting everything right and then you're hauling some of it home that was a problem exactly. if, we, if we hauled stuff home i always felt like we're handling it twice and it you know it was fun um i learned a lot going to farmers markets but then we uh, decided that, that we didn't want to do that because there was so much downtime. There was so, and that day away from the farm was a big day. It was a big, oh, yeah. it was a long day, you know? Yep. And, uh, but we, we actually enjoyed it. Have thought that maybe when me and Jill are retired, like we're in our eighties, it'd be fun to just have a, a rig just for going to the farmer's markets, just so you could, just so you could yak, you know, it'd be kind of fun. Oh, no. Yeah. And I love the interaction with the other growers too. I mean, I've always told people like, all, especially right here in the area, yourself included, all of our, you know, so-called competition, they're our biggest supporters. Um, you know, some of the farms that we used to visit before we got into this, you know, now they're calling me wanting some vegetables every year and you know it's not that i'm doing something better than them but it's where i focused you know where they might be doing something different and then grew a little bit of vegetables it's where i focus my time and energy on is, is growing vegetables and, and we're doing pretty well with that um good yeah i've always i've always found that at the farm markets you know we never had any of the you know eye rolling or people you know looking at you weird we never had any of that issue like you see, you know, or hear the horror stories from the bigger towns. But um, yeah, we've always found that in our area, your competition is your biggest supporters. Hmm. Hmm. All right. Well, uh, do we have some questions for Bryce from the, the peanut gallery? Yep. Um, Joshua wanted to, oh, and could you do just a quick introduction because so many people came and missed it. Okay, well, Bryce, I'm going to reintroduce you because a lot of people have come in a little bit late, but this is okay. Bryce Mosier, and he lives in Falmouth, Michigan, which is uh, like next town over from me. If, if you guys uh, from around the world know where Ebels is, it's in the same town, all right? <laughs> Everybody knows where Ebels is, right? The same metropolis. Yeah, yeah, it's a metropolis. I'm <laughs> You're in the burbs, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And, uh, well, I, I left this out before, but you were a uh, U.S. Air Force member there for a while. Yes, four sir. years, right? Yep. Yep. Four years. Yep. Security forces, which uh, I worked with security forces quite a bit and know that career field pretty well. I wasn't one of them, but I knew I got to know them pretty well, hung around with them a lot. Different breed. Yeah, they didn't call it security <laughs> forces when I was then, though. They called it security police yeah sps yeah yes yeah, SPs. SPs. that was a tough job man i was at a b-52 base and they would oh, have some poor kind of... kid standing on the nose and one kid See, standing was... on the tail my my cousin was in before i was and he was a low toad um yeah stationed out at vandenberg and he told me if i want to go into that security you know law make sure you go in guaranteed law enforcement because that's what yeah. I wanted to do. And so I did. And I was so thankful after watching what some of those guys had to go through. 
I'd be patrolling bays through the housing area and they're counting rivets on, you know, the RC 135s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> counting rivets in the cold. In the cold. Yeah. All right. So Bryce uh, is working now uh, at his own CSA. Him and his wife, Nikki, and their daughter, Sophie, run this CSA, CSA which is Community Supported Agriculture. They have uh, near about 40 shares that they um, provide for people. And, and what that is, is uh, the people uh, contract with them for, I forget how many weeks you said, Bryce, how many 12 weeks? weeks? 12 weeks. 12, 12. weeks yep. of vegetables and they grow, you know, the whole gambit on their place and whatever's coming in that week that's what the people get. They get a, a share of that, which is usually about a grocery bag per week of whatever's coming in. Yep. So um, they're not going to be getting potatoes at the beginning of the season. They'll get them at the end of the season. They're, they won't get radishes at the end. They'll get them at the beginning. So that's kind of how it works. Um, we've gotten accustomed to get whatever we want from the store, no matter what part, no, no matter what time of the season it is but that's not how it really works with community supported agriculture. So um, Bryce and Nikki have been doing this. This is what, the fourth year? Fourth year, yep. Fourth year. And okay, I, I'm caught up on the intro. Now let's do some questions. So people do have questions for you. Yep. So here we go. Jill's gonna ask them, I guess. Well, you may have to repeat it. But once we're in. You want me to read it? Well, oh, that might be it. I know I spelled them because <laughs> I figured I'd tell you. What are your greenhouses made of? Can you tell us what your construction is like? Uh, well, my seedling house is actually kind of custom made. Um, I bought a, a bender from Johnny's. It's just a, a pipe bending jig. Um, yeah. We use the inch and three eighths uh, top rail from chain link fencing. Um, okay. Bent those hoops. The other two structures are actually like two inch heavy gauge. It's got to be 12 or 14 gauge um, galvanized, but they're actually, you know, kits that I bought from Hortmark. Um, they're out of KPAC, Michigan. Great guys. It's a couple buddies that started the business and they, they sell hundreds of these things every year. Um, yeah, I, I bought another greenhouse tomorrow. It would be another one of them from Hortmark. They're awesome. Yeah, we've had zero problems yeah. with it. I've actually been in Bryce's greenhouses, the one that was up last year, and I was really impressed with that. The construction on that was something else. Like you could, you could keep equipment in there in the winter time, I suppose. Oh, easily, yeah. easily. It was big too, you know, well made. Yeah. All right. I hope that helps. That question helps. Let's see. That was Joshua. Now, Lone Star. Lone Star is our buddy out in uh, Texas. Did you see the the I video did. that he put up on that retort? Holy that smokes, Lone Star. Awesome. Yeah, I, I want to see more of that. I seen it was on a trailer. I think he should head north. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't really uh, I didn't really understand how it worked. Um, it looks like he kindles it underneath and then the the pyrolysis gas comes back under, but I want to see more of that Lone Star if we could. Uh, maybe. Okay. Are you a one man show? I think we answered that. It's, it's Bryce and his wife, Nikki, and then uh, eight year old daughter, Sophie. And this is from Brittany. Brittany's our buddy over in Minnesota, Brittany and John. And. Um. I can't read this first word and it does it doesn't make sense. I know because I just seed scrolled it. started inside. She has seeds started oh, inside. Okay. Would it be a good idea to have a fan blowing air around to help harden them up, seeing as it's still cold here in Minnesota or whatever the weather is doing lately? All right. Yeah, maybe you could talk about that whole concept of hardening plants off. Yeah, you know way I start, I put my stuff in a germ chamber, comes out, I put it under grow lights for about two weeks until the cotyledons are, you know, 
getting down on the plants, depending on what they are. Um, and then I put them out in the greenhouse and I keep the temperatures quite low. Um, like my tomatoes, I'll let them get down to 40 degrees. I know it slows the growth down, but when yeah. I put them outside, I've, I've had pretty good luck without, you know, anything getting injured from cold weather. Um, air movement is key. You got to have air movement on your seedlings. Um, if not, they'll be very limp. And then when you do put them outside, they'll snap off. Um, yeah, I would definitely have a fan going on them. You know, make sure you're getting plenty of light on them. That's one of the big no-nos is not enough light. Um, if you're using just artificial light, you're going to want at least 16 hours of it. You know, every oh, really? day. Yeah. Huh. Um, but if you can get them in a window where you can just supplement for like a few hours a night, you know, after the sun goes down, put them on for another couple hours, you'll do fine with them. Okay. Can you uh, tell us what the grow chamber or the uh, germination chamber, what is that exactly? Well, it's, it's basically just a uh, um, old, ref you know, actually it was a freezer, stand-up freezer that I put a regular incandescent bulb in the bottom. Um, and then I wired that into a thermal controller so I can set a temperature on it and it holds okay. that temperature. Um, being that it's a, you know, stand-up freezer, it's got its own magnetic seal around the door, holds the humidity in, and it holds everything at the perfect temperatures. Um, you know, I've gone from like where it takes 14 days to get peppers up, it only takes me about five days. Um, really? I, I can do lettuce overnight in there. Um, it, it's almost like magic using that thing. I, I'll never go without it again. And this is my first year using it. Um, it was something I had on my list of to-dos. And a buddy of mine happened to have a freezer this year that conked out. I took it from him, and I, I'm probably going to build a second one. Um, huh. There's been plenty of times where I've had it full, and I need more space. So, yeah, it, it, it works really well. Traditionally, all I did before was wrapped everything with like a uh, cling wrap, or I had all kinds of this uh, masking plastic for painting, and I'd yeah. wrap my flats with that to hold the moisture in, and then I'd stack them right on top of each other and put them underneath the heat lamp. And, you know, it worked. Um, heat and consistent moisture. That's that's how I get seeds to pop. So this has no, it, the light is underneath just for, for heat, right? It's, yep. so they're in the dark? Yeah. They germinate in the dark, okay. The, the only thing that won't germinate really well in the dark, um, let some, some varieties of lettuce, um, celery has to have light in order to germinate. Um, okay. But most everything else, what I'll do is, you know, I barely cover all my seeds. I don't go by any planting depths anymore. I just basically pack my flats there, set the seeds on, press them in a little bit, cover them with vermiculite, water them in, stick them in that germ chamber. And they, as soon as I start to see them, you know, heaving that vermiculite a little bit, they go underneath the grow light. Because okay. if you leave them in there, you know, I've missed, you know, like on a day, I, I'll forget to check it. And next thing you know, you got lettuce plugs that are sticking out of their spindly little things like that um so we track all data compilation is one of our biggest things every time i germinate something new i write down how many days it took so that huh. next time i go to do them again i know okay three days from now i gotta pull that one back out of there hmm. well, this is intriguing i mean there's a lot of information here there's a lot of stuff that you're just putting out that you understand that you know we don't really get the terms and uh i'm wondering how we could how we could get this information out more i mean you clearly understand this and that's the problem when you go into this you don't quite you don't quite get it it's it's a little oh, bit murky i know when i'm trying to do this five stuff. years ago i wouldn't have known what i'm talking about right now honestly I mean, yeah. that, that's literally how far i've come um yeah Read books. I mean, read books and watch videos. I mean, that, that's how you learn. But yeah. yeah, I wish we, you know, all, all the tribe was like close. I would love to have everybody out, especially like mid June when everything's green. You know, that'd be great. It really would to have a day 
where we could, you know, maybe barbecue a little bit and then meet and greet and things like that and just get a tour around and see how a guy does things. Yep. It always yeah, makes me that. feel good when I go to somebody else's place and see what they're doing, you know. It yep. gives me good ideas. I had a heck of a day today. How about you? How did you like the weather today? Uh, I, well, it was better today than what it was last night. I mean, last night was ridiculous. I, uh, I was in angry. bed last night. <laughs> I, woke, I woke up angry this morning. Did you? <laughs> As soon as I looked out the window and seen that snow on the ground, I was like, no, I'm not Yeah, yeah, that. I know. But, like, today, uh, it, it would warm up, it would get sunny, the wind would die, and you'd think, oh, okay, it's going to be a good day. And then all of a sudden, you just feel this cold air over you, steam's coming out of my mouth, and I look up, and it's completely overcast, and it's, yep. and it's blowing. And well, I, twice I today... I was out in the tunnel for a while today sweating. You know, it was 75, 80 yeah. degrees in there all day. So I didn't really have the wind blowing on me too much today. But yeah, when I'd go outside, it definitely had to put my hat back on. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, this has been a real informative interview. You know, this is the, the life and times of a, a vegetable uh, CSA grower. I mean, it's hard to know the questions to ask. But like somebody does this out there. Somebody grows vegetables and makes a living at it. And uh, really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Well, appreciate, appreciate all your help on the tribe, all that you share and all that stuff. It's really important. See, it goes a long way. Well, good. And uh, I would yeah, recommend I... people go on the tribe and, and back up a little bit and see what Bryce has, uh, has been doing. He puts up a lot of pictures and a lot of commentary about his operation. So... Uh, I salute you. Thank you very much for the help. <laughs> you bet, Mark. And uh, I guess we'll be we'll be talking as soon as my asparagus ready. Hey, I've got about 450 asparagus in the germ chamber right now. All right, all right. I I want I want to have a field of it. You know, a permanent field. Not not huge or anything, but just for my family, probably about 50 by 25. Because I really like asparagus. I got you covered. And I'm I'm willing to put some time in on it too. I mean, I want to maybe uh, even maybe even put plastic mulch down to, for starts. Or, yep. or we have this uh, mulch that Jill got that's it appears to be plastic, but I think it's made out of hemp, so it oh, it's yep. biodegradable. So the first year we could put out put that out we wouldn't have to do too much weed suppression i would think yeah but after a while, i lived in maine before and we used to go to a farm that it just came up every year and it was a you pick you go out there and you could pick it for i don't know what the guy wanted maybe a you know 50 cents or 75 cents or a buck a pound i don't remember a long time ago but every time i've tried to get it started around here there's so much weed seed that it just chokes it right out. Yeah, you almost got to have a stale seed bed in order to get it started around here. That lamb's cord will take it over and just choke it right out. Yeah, it's tough stuff. It's really yeah. tough stuff. And it's hard to shallow cultivate and not disrupt that stuff when it's just getting established, too. Um, mm -hmm. Deep mulch seems to work. We don't do asparagus much. Um, we will. We'll grow it together. Mm. It's a nice thing to have. It's really a nice thing to come up in the spring. Do you yeah. do garlic? Oh, yeah, lots of it. Yeah, I got garlic up already. and pretty high. It's pretty, yeah, pretty good we, stuff. Uh, we, we did a lot of garlic last year. A lot of garlic. I did plant some of it this spring. I, sp I planted about uh, a quarter of a row this spring. So maybe 20 feet or so. And yeah, it's not up yet. Bit. Yeah, just Does that what will happen? Until, yeah, I would just wait until about October before you harvest it. Okay. Instead of August. Yep. All right. Well, we're good. It's a lot of information. Right. I appreciate you coming on. Hey, no problem, Mark. All right. See you, Bryce. Jill's going to cut yep. you off. Oh, hey. Tatum just sent five bucks. Thank you, Tatum.
All right. Tatum sent you a super chat. So way to go. All right. Cut him off. <laughs> You're a 